labrīt, labrīt, mīļie studenti, cīnīmie kolēģi. Man ir tiešām prieks jūs visus redzēt šodien Rīgas Jūtiskās augstskolas telpās, un kā jau direktori minēja, tas šajā Covid kontekstā šī ir tie patīkamie brīži, vai ne? Nu lūk, otro gadu mēs jau noturam vasaras skolu starptautiskajās tiesībās un Eiropas, un Eiropas tiesībās. Um, ideja auga daudzus gadus manā galvā, <laughs> jāsaka tā, bet nu, praktiski bija diezgan neiespējami to uh, īstenot, ņemot vērā visas citas lietas, ko es paspēju izdarīt iepriekšējos gados. Bet nu, ja šis brīdis pienācis, um, jo um, ir pilnīgs skādris tas, ka uh, Latvija ir vien aktīvāk uh, ir jādarbojās gan Eiropas Savienības ietvaros, gan arī starptautiskajās attiecībās un starptautisko tiesību ietvaros. Es domāju, ka diemžēl mums pat, tepat blakus uh, 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 Krievijas uzsāptais karš uh, parāda to, ka zināšanas starptautiskajās tiesībās un arī Eiropas Savienības tiesībās uh, Latvijas uh, juristiem un, un, un arī, arī citu, citiem speciālistiem ir ļoti, ļoti vajadzīgas. Es domāju, ka jūs piekritīsiet tam. Un līdz ar to es uh, tiešām jūs aicinu izmantot šo iespēju, ka Rīgas jūtiskā augstskola sadarbībā ar nu, mūsu visiem uh, tiesnešiem, kas ir no Latvijas, un ģenerāla advokāti, un viņu uh, kolēģiem, uh, latviešiem kabinetos strādājošiem latviešu juristiem, jums piedāvā uh, šo, šo iespēju savas zināšanas nostiprināt, uzlabot un paplašināt. Un lūdzu arī izbaudet to, un uh, es nogāvu mums visiem uh, ļoti produktīvu darbu šo nākamo desmitdienu laikā. Tagad uh, es uh, pāriešu uh, uz uh, angļu valodu un, un uh, kā saka, pie, pieteikšu arī mūsu uh, uh, īpašo viesi. Um, so, uh, the tradition of the summer school uh, at the Riga Graduate School of Law, uh, I'm hoping to build it, <laughs> still it's the second time we meet uh, in Riga. And uh, the tradition started uh, also with the fact that we each year we have a keynote speaker, um, a, a guest, uh, a special uh, guest lecture. And last year it was the president of our court, <laughs> Hun Lennertz. And this year I have a great pleasure to welcome uh, our first Advocate General, uh, Maciej Spooner. Um, um, the, the fact that you are the first Advocate General tells, uh, and I should tell it to the audience, that it is really a great responsibility because you are responsible for all the very independent and absolutely brilliant <laughs> Advocate Generals, but they are still independent, but you are held <laughs> responsible <laughs> uh, for the functioning of, um, uh, of all of them and the fulfillment of that function in the Court of Justice. Now, uh, Advocate General and Professor Spuna, in fact, uh, is, uh, has a very interesting career. And one thing that I would like to emphasize, you were the uh, government agent of Poland to the Court of Justice. So actually, from a practical point of view, apart from uh, all of the great universities that you have graduated and your own uh, academic career, but from a practical point of view, you know both sides. <laughs> you know how it feels uh, to represent the government in the Court of Justice proceedings, and now it is a fascinating position to be an Advocate General because you are kind of between the two parties, the judges yeah. and that audience in the public <laughs> hearing room. Uh, so it is with this um, fantastic, you know, uh, um, sort of multiple perspective that uh, uh, I'm very happy that Advocate General agreed to come to Riga uh, in the context that is not very easy, and it is for this that I am very, very grateful to you, Maciek. And uh, yeah, and I think we will continue uh, this uh, um, uh, tradition of uh, really setting you on a particular level for the summer <laughs> school with your uh, uh, with your. Uh, introductory uh, lecture. 
Um, so with this, uh, I give you the floor, um, and uh, yeah, we can work for uh, for sort of as you have already envisaged that for yeah. fourteen minutes. You'll yeah. you'll and then there will be questions. You can yeah. have okay. questions and comments. Or comments, yeah. And also, the I I say that during the the coffee break, uh, I'm sure that you will be able to yes. continue asking your questions maybe more more privately. This is a very Latvian way to go yeah, and yeah. ask <laughs> in the coffee break. So thank you so thank much you, and uh, please take the floor. Thank you very much, Ineta, for this introduction. Good morning, everyone. In the first place, good morning, students, because you are the most important people in the summer school. And um, my immense thanks to the organizer for organizers for inviting me to this event. I must confess, before I start my, my lecture, my speech, uh, to admit that, um, uh, that you, as the, the Riga, gradu uh, uh, Riga Graduate School of Law, you have great reputation all over Europe for many years. Uh, I remember then throughout my academic and judicial career, I met in many places people linked to some extent to the Riga Graduate School of Law. I met great professors who were teaching here, great alumni who then became uh, wonderful lawyers. And um, it made me very proud as an East European that, uh, that in the East we uh, were in in a position to create such an excellent law school that all Europeans, but especially all uh, people coming from the eastern part of Europe, like myself, were, we are so proud. I had the pleasure to cooperate, ha still have a pleasure to cooperate uh, with great uh, Latvian lawyers at the Court of Justice, starting with your current president and former judge uh, at the Court of Justice. Ineta, Laila, Peteris, Inge. Uh, I'm always impressed by, by the quality of, uh, of uh, your reasoning, of your legal knowledge, and uh, there's no wonder that, uh, uh, that you have been able to create such an excellent, in such an excellent institution as, uh, Riga as, as the Riga Graduate School of Law. And now let me proceed to my lecture I've been thinking a lot what should I choose as a title for my introduction, introductory lecture to the summer school of, uh, or in Riga. And actually, I have decided to, to, to speak a little bit about the internet. I must say that this, uh, that this is the subject which is rel relatively easy because uh, we do not have a clue. I mean, I in internet, especially if we analyze legal aspects of the internet, it's very easy to, to ask questions, to identify problems, but it's extremely difficult to find proper solutions because everything is evolving. And uh, just to give you an example, if you, we look throughout the case law of the Court of Justice, uh, very often, the court is not following the opinions of its advocate general. The court did not follow Advocate General Cruz Villalon in Teleca Belvin. The court did not follow Mercure Watlet in GS Media. I was not followed in uh, McFadden, Vege Kunst. Laila, you will not also be followed in many cases, <laughs> but uh, it, does not it, it does not mean that advocates general are, are less gifted. Sim it simply proves that the, the, the problems are extremely complex and complicated, and uh, there is no one solution to each problem, and uh, especially in the domain of new technologies where uh, the evolution is extremely fast, uh, also courts, lawyers, should be always ready to rethink and, if necessary, adapt, amend existing case law. Because at the moment where some decisions are rendered, we are sometimes not aware of the future development or of all practical consequences of uh, some uh, phenomenon. As a matter of fact, uh, 
the legal problems of the internet constitute a good illustration of the phenomenon of lawyers tending to react to new economic realities with certain delay. And this is not an accusation. Before one decides to legislate or to regulate a newly emerged uh, economic model, it is first necessary to assess thoroughly all social, economic, and ethical implications of this model. One should also ask the question of the extent to which the existing legal framework responds to this newly emerging economic phenomena and whether new rules are at all necessary. Um, to say in 2022 that the internet constitutes a new technology seems a little bit backward or outdated. We all use the internet on everyday basis at the same time problems pertaining to the interne internet remain unresolved. For, for example, we do not know how to deal uh, with various infringements committed with the use in the connection with the use of internet. We do not know how to define some of the legal transactions concluded with the help of the internet. That is to say, how to identify and define a proper legal framework. <coughs> And in this introduction, just let, let me uh, give a few examples. So in the first place, the Internet enormously facilitated the transmission of information, including the transmission of works otherwise protected by various IP and intellectual property rights. One could therefore conclude that violation of I, violations of IP rights have become facilitated. But on the other hand, when one looks at the way in which many platforms offering music, uh, books or music operate, it appears that the right holders have obtained new means over how to control the way uh, the works are used. They know exactly how often we listen to a particular piece of music. They know exactly how long we read a particular book. Is it okay? Yeah, but I'm still in the introduction. I'm sorry. For <laughs> 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 I remember about the slides. Yeah. Uh, platforms may also identify what are, what are our preferences or, t or what are um, other activities we undertake while reading a book or, or listening to a particular place of music. So, so on the one hand, viol violations became, well, are facilitated but at the same time the control the platform exercise uh, over us is also, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's also uh, extended. Secondly, until the emergence of Internet, the essential challenge for every business undertaking has been to ensure that uh, supply would find and match the relevant demand. Nowadays, at least in theory, the Internet has created a situation in which every supply can meet every demand. And this has tremendous impact on economy. As an illustration, let's look at such a platform as Airbnb. It substantially reinforced uh, the market of renting and letting apartments. Of course, the market for short-term renting existed before as well, but Airbnb provided a platform for this business to be carried out more smoothly. It is no longer a big effort for any property owner to find a tenant for a short period rental. And this, of course, has some consequences also for the construction industry because people are willing to buy apartments because then renting them out does not require a big effort. Third, thirdly, but this is to some extent self-explanatory, the Internet has completely modified one of the fundamental notions of every legal system, that is the notion of territoriality. The distinction between what is territorial and what is extraterritorial has become blurred. And fourthly, the expansion, uh, this is a very concrete example, but I think it, it illustrates a, a general tendency. Fourthly, the expansion of the use of internet services 
has as its consequence that the rationale of some EU instruments of secondary le legislation has uh, become obsolete. And I would, just to give you one example, I was once acting as an advocate general in the case France Television, which concerns the interpretation of one of the provisions of one of the directives, not, not to mention which one, but this provision uh, allows member states to impose on some undertakings providing electronic communication network the obligation to broadcast some radio or, or TV channels, so-called must-carry obligations. So if someone is offering a cable TV to users, uh, the legislation may oblige uh, um, this company also to provide access to some most important TV channels, basically public TV. But at the time when live streaming is commonly offered and used, broadcaster, broadcasters are no longer interested in offering this possibility to, to other companies. Because, well, I do not need to give my signal to a cable TV if, if I give possibility of streaming, that's sufficient. So the question that the court had to tackle was simply to what extent this initial must-carry obligation transformed because of the development of live streaming of TV programs into must-offer obligations, because situation changed. Now this ca cable TV operator started to ask, give us the signal, yeah? because the, the, uh, the broadcasters are, were no longer interested in doing so. And finally, the use of the internet has revisited the existing interplay between various fundamental rights. In many cases, and in, Eta Iavos, in, in, in all cases where called upon to interpret um, EU law provisions pertaining to internet, the core issues is how to properly strike the balance uh, between several conflicting fundamental rights. This is essentially uh, the case of data protection, but I will not speak about data protection uh, this morning. Uh, so now let me <laughs> proceed to the slide. This is the, the outline of my speech. And of course, as you can guess, I will not be in a position to, to speak about every aspect in detail. But my, intentions, uh, my intention for this lecture, for this introductory lecture, is basically to highlight the most important issues and to say uh, in which moment the court faced a dilemma, whether to go into direction A or to direction B, and what are the consequences that the court went to this and not to another direction. And um, let me start uh, with the question of uh, liability of uh, internet, uh, internet intermediaries, internet platforms. Uh, What's the, uh, the core problem where we, uh, um, uh, where we are uh, facing the, the question of this liability? Um, it is clear for all of you that if you have um, a crime committed over the internet, be it you know, violation of personality rights, violation of IP rights, uh, from a practical point of view, it's always easier to issue an injunction against intermediary than against an infringer, Im infringer himself. Yes, am I offended on the internet and someone put on Facebook a post insulting me, there is no point to identify the real infringer. The real point is to attack or adopt an injunction against intermediary to block the access to this post. First of all, it's difficult to, to identify the infringer of the internet. And secondly, in the digital world, the sole identification on the in, of the infringer does not in itself end the infringement. Because the, the uploading or downloading of illegal content may be done automatically. And uh, what is the legal framework of the union? And uh, here I deliberately uh, deliberately um, choose the existing legislation. I will not speak about uh, recently adopted or the legislation which is at the process of being adopted because we might have some cases coming to the court and I do not want to, to, um, to, to show my position on, 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 on some issues. But 
uh, legal framework. First, we have uh, two directives which aiming, uh, which a aim at the reinforcement of IP rights. This is so-called InfoSoc Directive, Information Society Directive, and the enforcement of other intellectual property rights than copyrights. Copyrights is the first, and all other IP rights um, uh, um, uh, um, of the um, enforcement the, the directive. But on the other hand, we have the Electronic Commerce Directive, and the Electronic Commerce Directive, the, the basic aim of this directive is to limit the, liabi the liability of platforms um, and uh, internet intermediaries. Just two of the most important provisions, you do not need to uh, read it, but I will read it for you. Uh, so. Uh, this two first directive provides for the obligation that right holders should be in position to apply uh, for injunction against intermediaries whose services are used by a third party to infringe a copyright or similar provision in the enforcement directive. So simply, me as a right holder should always have a possibility to ask for injunction against intermediary, not against an infringer, because it would say difficult to identify the infringer, but against intermediary. In, in intermediary could be, in the first place, internet service provider, a company that gives access to internet, or a platform like YouTube, like Google, like eBay, or whatever, that could also take some measures to block the access to certain information. But on the other hand, we have this uh, e-commerce directive that uh, establishes some limitations on the liability imposed on entities providing the information society services. So Merconduit, just giving access to internet, hosting is a very important article 14. Uh, if a company, a platform, offers a possibility to host the information, to what extent such a platform can be liable for infringement uh, which are made through the, uh, the content of the information hosted on the server. So the essential question is how to reconcile, on the other hand, this obligation stemming from, stemming from uh, uh, InfoSoc and Enforcement Directive to protect copyright effectively with, on the other hand, provisions of e-commerce which contains limitations on the liability of providers of services for unlawful acts committed by a third party with respect to the information transmitted. In other words, how to make sure that internet, uh, internet intermediaries, which are normally qualified as information society service providers, are shielded from, from in injunctions. It's obvious that otherwise the economic activity would face excessive obstacles and the right of internet users would be disproportionately limited. Let's imagine that YouTube is liable for all information which is um, hosted on their servers without any further conditions. Then such a business would never, would never, would never survive. Because there is no doubt that uh, the access to internet must be uh, assessed in the light of the fundamental right of freedom of information. And uh, the entire case law, and of course you can imagine I cannot speak about every case here, but this is the most important developments, I d cases that I identified about uh, the uh, Mm, this reconciliation of uh, right to protect IP and personality rights and uh, the scope of liability of internet intermediaries or platforms. So the whole case, you're starting with ProMusica, where for the first time the court emphasized the need to strike the balance between two conflicting fundamental rights, shows that uh, this exercise is very often uh, about fundamental rights, uh, what fundamental rights are, are at stake. It's the uh, right to property, in intellectual property, versus the respect for private life and family life. 
protection of personal data, freedom of thought and freedom of expression of information, freedom of art, freedom to conduct business. Uh, what, I would, what could I say? There is one case pending, uh, which is Louboutin. It's about the notion of the use uh, of a trademark. And uh, since it's a pending case, I just mentioned you the facts. The essential question is whether uh, eBay, uh, whether Amazon, which is offering for sale products, which are very often its own products, but also products of the third parties, to what extent Amazon can be considered as using a trademark if a private person offering a particular product uh, via Amazon is selling a fake product. Because it's clear that, uh, uh, that, uh, that Amazon might, might be liable as a secondary liability, but, uh, but, um, uh, we don't, but we do not know whether this activity could, could be considered as a primary liability. And this is maybe one thing that I would, uh, uh, that were the court paved a way of interpreting traditional concepts of uh, liability, tort liability. Because if you looked from the traditional perspective of private law, it's very easy to identify, to say who is a tort feeser and who can be secondary liable. Those who helped, inspired, give means to, to commit a tort. And in an ideal scenario of the internet, the best would be, okay, the infringer is that person who actually infringes, who commits a tort, yes? Someone who uploaded or downloaded certain information over the internet. But as I said, uh, this in this digital world, this concept worked well only in theory, because in practice, what counts is the, is the liability of internet, internet uh, intermediaries and um, and uh, platforms, and the case which is not actually mentioned here, the case about uh, Pirate Bay. Think about Pirate Bay. Do you know what's a what's a Pirate Bay? This uh, bit torrents exchange of of illegal content. Of course, in theory, if we look at the it, if we look how Pirate Bay operates, it's clear that those who are the infringers are individuals who are sharing because they're fully aware that they are sharing illegal information. But um, uh, this would not be possible without, uh, without Pirate Bay. And that's the reason why, and the court was very much criticized for this, reversed this uh, notion. I said, no, primary responsible is Pirate Bay, because this is the organization, this is, uh, this is the activity that amount to be a communication to the public. Without Pirate Bay, people would not be able to commit any infringements of the internet to that scale. So that was the case in which the court was precisely called upon to say what kind of liability. Is it primary liability or secondary liability? And why this question is important in the, in the context of EU law? Because uh, in EU law, we only harmonize the notion of primary liability. Secondary, secondary liability left, is left for the member states. So if the court went to the direction and would say, well, primary liable are only individuals who committed these infringements via internet, uh, the responsibility of platforms like Pirate Bay could be only secondary. What, what would it mean that under each legislation of the member state, this responsibility would be different. And you can imagine that the, the main obstacles for the internet functioning properly is the uniformity of rules, because once you adapt to the legislation of one, ju of one jurisdiction, you can very easily disregard the <coughs> legislation of another jurisdiction. Let me now, because it's to some extent linked, uh, the notion of communication to the public. Uh, this is something which concerns in particular copyright, and uh, this actually will be continuation of what I'm saying about this division of primary and secondary, uh, secondary liability. So InfoSoc Directive 
defines different rights of a right holder of copyrights, and one of the rights is, uh, which is uh, especially important in the context of internet, is the right uh, to make uh, something available to the public. So if you want to make avail a work make uh, mm, available to the public, uh, you must have a consent of a copyright holder. And then what consequences it has uh, uh, on the internet? Just a second. Let's start with linking. You know, hyperlinking, what's linking? And uh, again, how the, the case law of the court developed here? The question was very simple. What happens if I put off my website a hyperlink to another website? Does this constitute a communication to the public? The court decided this, uh, uh, this uh, mm, issue in the case Fenson, that was a Swedish case about a website which simply incorporated hyperlinks to different to other websites, websites where uh, there were some uh, news and, ar and uh, articles on current activities, current news. <coughs> so everyone could click into the link and be uh, automatically redirected to the relevant website where the information, the news were, uh, were uh, presented. And what's important about this case, and here the role of an, ad of an advocate general, Svensson was decided without an opinion of an, of an advocate general, and what the court said in Svensson. The court said linking, hyperlinking is an act of communication. So you communicate. By putting a hyperlink on your website, you communicate in information to all users of the Internet. But there is no new public, because information which was already published on the internet was in any event available to everyone. So, <coughs> act of communication, but no new public, so there is no, uh, no act of communication to the public. No violation of copyright. Then <coughs> the court decided best water against, without an opinion of, advocate, uh, of an advocate general, it was not even a judgment, it was uh, an order, a recent order, which is about framing. Um, the difference between linking and framing is very subtle, but for a user it's important because with linking, you're aware that you click on the information, you redirect it to another website. Whereas with framing, you are not aware of this because te the technique of framing, even though based on the same technical uh, in, uh, mechanism, makes the impression that the information is contained already on the website you are visiting. Yes? So you open the website, you see an information, but you are not aware of the fact that this information was, exact, was in reality taken from <coughs> another website. The court said in <coughs> Best Water that no violation of copyright. Simply linking. So the act of communication, but not new public. And then came GS Media case. GS Media uh, was decided with an opinion of, uh, uh, after the opinion of the Advocate General Watler, who was not followed, <coughs> because the, that was the first case about linking in which the court was called upon to, to uh, decide about, about linking. And the uh, majority of member states, as well as the European Commission, pleaded in the direction that linking should not be considered even as an act of communication. The difference with GS Media was that the information uh, to which the link was linking, <laughs> the hyperlink was linking, was the illegal, in, 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 uh, illegal information. So there was something published on the internet without the consent of a right holder. So <coughs> it was actually about Dutch edition of Playboy and some pictures that were published on the internet before the edition of Playboy was issued was available. And other uh, websites simply uh, contained uh, a hyperlink to this, to this information. <coughs> the court confirms Fenson, but said one thing. If you uh, put a hyperlink that 
redirect you to an information which is available on the internet, but without the consent of the right holder, this constitutes an act of communication to the public. So you violate copyright, IP, IP rights. Um, and um, moreover, the court uh, introduced the criterion of intention. So if you do it uh, within the context of your commercial activity, supposed to know that the information to which you uh, mm, send the user Di redirect the user, you should know whether it's legal or, or not legal. If it's, if it's illegal, then you are liable because that's your duty if you do it from in the context of your commercial activity. If you are a private individual, you can still plead that you put this link, but once you learned that the information was illegal, you stop and you, you are not liable. What's the problem with this uh, reasoning and why the court is criticized. I, I will, of course, defend the position of the court, but we also have to be have to be uh, aware that this approach is very the may, may be criticized. Uh, IP rights, personality rights, are uh, rights uh, in them against everyone. So, if I'm an owner of something, the, someone is stealing my property the intention of the tort visa should not matter. Yes? If I have a bicycle, whether uh, a thief was aware or not that it's my, uh, it really doesn't matter. My property was deprived. So um, the court is criticized uh, for introducing the criterion of intention to the protection of, uh, of um, uh, rights extra omnes rights rights in them the same comes uh, for the for linking again uh, this vige bild kunz decision of the court uh, was about um, was about framing and the court said because now there was a, a, mm, a very huge incentive for the court to say that framing it's not the same as hyperlinking at, at least from the perspective of the user. So the court said that if me as a right holder who puts information, who puts information on the internet, I do not want this information to be framed by other users, I should provide some technical means to prevent framing because you can do it. Whether it's effective or not, it's another story because as internet there is no effect on the internet there is no effective protection. Every every protection can be can be dismantled. But if I do not want my information to be framed by others, I should uh, provide some technical means. And again, the, ca the, the same reproach be should, uh, could be uh, addressed towards the Court of Justice, saying, look, it's like bicycle. If you come on a bicycle to the Riga School of Law and you park your bicycle before the entrance, can we say, OK, if you lock your bicycle, then it will be protected? But if you forget to lock to lock your bicycle, then I'm sorry, you give your consent to any potential person to use your bicycle. Uh, so this reasoning, it definitely uh, works in the normal world. But maybe, and here uh, comes my defense of the court, maybe in the digital world, this logic doesn't work. In internet, it's not so easy to identify whether this information is protected, by whom is protected whether I can use or I cannot use. So maybe we should, ha we should rethink our traditional no uh, notions of private law and say, I'm sorry, on the internet, if you want some information to be protected, you need to uh, undertake some technical effort in order to assure that, uh, this, is, uh, that, this, is that this is actually covered by... Uh, um, by uh, protection by uh, exclusive rights. And there's well, two, three minutes left, so I will not say everything, but maybe m the last issue I wanted to mention, in because I find it extremely interesting, and also illustrating uh, the challenges for the internet. This is the Tom Cabinet no. ruling. Okay, okay. Uh, so I could develop uh, digital exhaustion uh, issue. Uh, digital exhaustion 
mm, well, according to the rule of exhaustion, once a copy of a, of a protected work has been lawfully placed in circulation, the copyright holder can no longer object that that copy being resold by a person who has acquired it. So if you buy a book, legally of course, then the author receives its remuneration and then you are completely entitled to resell your book to someone else. Then you, if you resell, you do not violate any exclusive rights because uh, the, the right of the owner was e exhausted. The reason is simply that copyright cannot take precedence over the right of ownership, ownership of a copy of a book by a person who acquired. <coughs> and furthermore, when a copy of the work has been placed in circulation by the author with his consent, the author is deemed to obtain the remuneration due in respect of that copy. Uh, and then comes the problem whether we can apply the same reasoning for a digital copy. So if I buy a digital copy of a book, of a work protected by copyright or music, can I say, okay, I bought it, the author received the re remuneration, and I can resell it. Uh, everyone feels the difference, because a copy of the book is only one copy. If, uh, you, you cannot make other copies. Uh, okay, and you can use photocopying, but it's not, let's say, identical copy. Um, then there is a difference between a new book and a second-handed book. Uh, with digital copy, these differences does not exist because every copy is exactly the same as the original. Yes, digital you can say w in in a. Mm, if we speak about a digital content, we cannot say what's original, what's a copy, because everything is the same. The digital copy doesn't, it's not subject to deterioration. <coughs> but uh, the logic could be the same. And one of the mm, uh, Dutch clubs of readers, they <coughs> simply organized the exchange of uh, digital books, saying, OK, if I buy a book, I'm entitled to sell it to another person while I'm deleting this book from my computer. So one copy exists. In theory, we could envisage such a system that if people were honest, and we should always, all lawyers should always act on the presumption that people are honest, that if you sell a copy, you are deleting this copy from your own, from your own device, from your own computer. But what is the problem? If you uh, so, in theory, there, are th there were very strong arguments to say that we should apply also the principle of exhaustion to a digital copy. Uh, but I wonder if you are aware that when you are mm, reading e-books or are listening to the music from <coughs> Spotify or the, you know, so, many, so many apps where you could read books, you never buy you never buy uh, a copy, it's simply a license. And in the digital world, this difference between a license and buying, acquiring, acquiring ownership um, is very difficult to identify. In a normal world, in a traditional world, the difference exists. If you buy a book, you know that this copy of a book your, your, is yours. If you go to a library and you borrow a book, you know that the book is just to read. So <coughs> if you're honest, you care about it. If it's your own, yeah, you also care about it, but, you, but it's, not, it's, not, it's, it's not your duty. In the digital world, this distinction is very subtle. And no one of us carefully reads general conditions. If we start to use Spotify or, or, or Rakuten or, or, if, or, I don't, or any other um reader uh, platform offering books to read or music to to listen we never read the general general conditions uh simply what were interesting is simply the access to the information so if let's imagine that the court because the court in the in tom cabinet so said no digital exhaustion but let's imagine that the court said something different and said look we have digital exhaustion. What would be the consequence in practice? That no one 
would ever sell a digital content. So, uh, so every possibility of reading books would simply be a license. <coughs> and, if, and if it's a license, then of course there, is, there, there would be no, no exhaustion. Uh, there is one issue, but I didn't have time to develop in, in this, in my opinion, in Tom Cabinet, because, as you know, we are limited by number of pages at the court, so we cannot sometimes <laughs> write too much. <laughs> but uh, I think that if ever we envisage digital exhaustion, we should, in the first place, uh, create a new concept of acquiring a digital context in order to uh, to eliminate this difference between ownership and license. Because in, indeed, in digital world, this distinction, this distinction should not exist. The acquisition of the content should be one transaction, be it as a license or acquisition of, of, of an ownership. Because from the practical point of view, if you get access to a digital information, then we do not really care whether it's under license or under ownership, unlike with the physical objects where this distinction really matters. So maybe in the future, but that's the task for the legislator to think about an instrument of secondary legislation defining the concept of uh, acquisition of a digital content. Because once we have this defined, then you can say, okay, now we can think what would be uh, the consequences of uh, exhaustion. Because in reality, you know, as I said in the beginning of my lecture, over the internet it's very easy to transmit in information, to violate, infringe uh, exclusive rights via internet. But at the same time, we are also subject to control. So if you the difference that if you borrow a book from the library, traditional library, the librarian doesn't know whether we read this book, whether we read or not, where we're keeping this book. But a platform who is offering books to read, they know exactly whether we indeed read the book, uh, at what time we, we read the book, with what speed, and even what were our, our other activities we undertook while reading this book. So the word completely, completely changed. So let me finish here. Uh, I would just tell you what there were other uh, issues I wanted to discuss with you, Uberization um, uh, and, uh, and some examples of balancing of fundamental rights. But I always say to myself that the introductory lecture to a summer school should not be too complicated, not to discourage the students from the rest of the summer school. So I'll, I'm at your disposal uh, here in the room, and uh, I will also have coffee with you after the lecture if you have questions that you do not dare to ask in public. Thank you very much for your attention. So um, now is the moment for uh, some questions and uh, and comments, uh, and I suggest yeah you use the opportunity. Um, yeah. <laughs> say that the main object is to is to assure fairness and justice over the internet well, and uh, yeah I mean it's extremely difficult the, it's extremely difficult because you know the challenges are extremely diverse one of the challenges for us and I also speak in the name of uh, Ineta uh, Laila Pateris 
in God, it's simply that our knowledge, technical knowledge, is limited. We do not know what is technically possible, what is impossible. What are the purposes that some platforms are gathering certain information? What is the use of the in of the in of this information? What are the I the I the implications? So, we are doing our best, but with certain limits that we must be aware of them. Uh, just to give you an example, I mean, there was a Google, uh, Google uh, one of the Google cases at the Court of Justice in Luxembourg, and uh, the 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 agent uh, counsel for Google, uh, the, the, was the the question from the court was uh, about this ge uh, geolocalization. To what extent Google is able to identify from which place a re research initiated? Because the question of one of the judges of the court was simply yes, but there are systems which allow to hide your location. And the answer of Google, no. 99,9% we are, if we want, we always identify the place from which uh, a particular research is initiated. We are not able to control it, to check it whether it's true, whether it's true or not. So with Despite these shortcomings, I mean, the, court, the, the task of the courts, of legislators, it was simply to bring justice to the largest possible extent in this digital world. And as I said, sometimes it would require, as the court did on many occasions, to depart from traditional concepts of private public law, because not all concepts we, are, we were taught at school are appropriate to the to internet. Any comments? Yes. Um, you mentioned uh, what would normally be termed uh, the digital activism on behalf of the court. Yeah. Uh, that's brought about um, in cases that you spoke of. Um, I was wondering if, if there's uh, been an opportunity to reflect in the court on uh, similar previous historic challenges where there's a lot of uh, decisions based on, uh, just, uh, on, on, on what is just rather than what, what the Commission and Parliament has decided uh, how it should be and uh, whether there's any uh, forecast that you're willing to make as to where are we going with this and whether that means more regulation or, or more activism of the court because that's just the capacity of the institutions that regulates that or, or anything else that we can learn from history from yeah. similar topics. Well, that's the that's the question. Thank you for the question, but that's for another lecture, and I will try to answer it. Aspects. Well, it's judicial activism, and the other aspect are uh, lessons learned from history. And if you look. I will start with the second aspect. Yes, indeed, I'm asking myself when writing these opinions of, on new technologies that we are in a similar situation like 100 years ago, I don't know, stealing electricity. Yeah? <laughs> That's the best example where there was the crime of stealing in the criminal court in, uh, in Prussia, and then what to do if someone is stealing electricity? What's electricity? So then we expected some judicial de developments. Then the concept of of a tort and tort liability. Tra traditionally, tort was based on thought. But then when we started to have uh, railway, big factories, where accidents were absolutely normal, we also had to readapt 100, 150 years ago our way of thinking about torts and say, no, in some cases, you must be liable even though there is, not fault, there is no fault there is no negligence of your side because if someone is a victim of a, of a rail accident, traffic accident, a factory accident, then what matters is the right of the victim and we cannot subject the liability of a railway car f factory to the intention or negligence because that was, that was simply equitable solution. And now another question is with the new technologies that uh, mm, uh, the activists of the court. Um, I know there are very many accusations to the court uh, of judicial activism. And uh, we personally say it's for the legislator. In the first place, it's for the legislator to 
uh, to provide for these rules. We cannot in invent anything out of the blue. Uh, but at the same time, we have to be aware of two aspects. First of all, uh, the EU legislator is, a, I would say, not weak, but not efficient legislator. Because in a member state, if a constitutional court says something, at least a legislator can react immediately, because it's the same, uh, same as Senate and the President yeah, in uh, Latvia. In, uh, in EU, the decision-making process is much more complicated, and the ordinary legislative procedure, it takes ages to react, to react to our judgments. And also, if you look that sometimes, you know, we are criticizing for activism, but if you take an example of the directive uh, 219-790 that I was, I'm not intending to speak about because we have many cases on copyright in the digital single market, famous Article 17. Article 17, which says about liability of platforms, of YouTube, Google, eBay, for the information transmitted. Look at this article how this article is drafted, and then tell me how this article could be interpreted without judicial activism. It leaves so much room for maneuver <laughs> that uh, it's simply that the legislator did not agree on, certain solution, on some solution provided for the mechanism, which leaves enormous space of discretion for judiciary. And then it's our task to, to do it. Yeah, but, the, but, but here you have the permission, yes. So you can do what you want, yes? <laughs> yes, yes. yes. <laughs> I'm at your disposal. It's your local tradition. Inga. <laughs> when it is that time, I have... A particular witness uh, for maybe uh, a <laughs> even <laughs> even if it is a pending case. But this is an interesting um, an interesting issue. I agree um, the protection of the right uh, via um, internet platforms, and we know that Amazon and Alibaba are the largest vendors in in terms of market coverage. And what um, perplexes me, maybe I take one of the aspects that we have seen in trademark cases, um, that um, both Amazon and Alibaba, and I think eBay does the same, they give every product a unique identification number. Something that we have, for example, a personal identification number, so do the internet platforms with every item that is being sold, um, and even with the new edition, the new edition again receives a new identification number. And um, my question is whether this um, is an element that um, is being discussed uh, in uh, the pending Lombardon case, because indeed, if you give a, a, a unique identification number to every item that you sell as a vendor, and as an internet platform, would that imply that you do at least a, a, an initial background check on the authenticity mm. of the items that you sell, whether that could be a link mm. between giving that unique number and uh, checking the, uh, <coughs> the lawfulness, if I may say, of, uh, or the authenticity of the item that is being sold. Thank you, Inge, for this question. As you can guess, I'm, I'm not in a position to, to discuss every detail. I mean, that is, that is, I mean, my opinion is published, and, and I did not, did not discuss the question of identification of, a, of a num giving ID number to every product. My first reaction would be that, uh, that given, giving uh, a number to a product does not, am does not amount to the possibility of controlling whether the product is fake or not. But if I can take this opportunity to send <laughs> just one message, but it, it, it also stems from my, mm, my opinion. Uh, when you speak about platforms like, like Alibaba, eBay, but also you know the traditional Uber, uh, Uber uh, uh, Airbnb, um, 
And this is not only something that stems from my opinion, but also from the research uh, undertook in this area, is that uh, on the one hand, we have the rel relations r relationship between the platform and the user. And here we can, re we can rely on the principle that if platform, the platform does more, more responsible the platform is towards the user, towards the client. So I'm p I am perfectly fine that from the perspective of a consumer, the Amazon is a seller, no matter whether it sell its own product or product of third, of third party. So more involvement, more you do, more responsible you are, but towards the users. But here with uh, Louboutin, uh, we are talking not about the relation between the platform and the user by the third party. And uh, my logic is the following. We cannot say that if platform does more to its consumers, more it becomes more liable towards uh, third parties. Because what would be, you know, from the economic analysis, what would be the impact? The platforms would be very much reluctant to offer more services to the users because if they do more services to the users, if, uh, if they are nicer to consumers, then they becoming also more liable towards third parties. And it should not work like this. We should very clearly distinguish the, rela the relation platform user, platform third party. And Louboutin case is the case about relation platform third party. Thank you to the interpreters. for o opening the summer school and for bringing us immediately into what is really uh, um, sort of the real challenge of the modern world and uh, opening a little sort of uh, curtain to you how we struggle <laughs> in the <laughs> court of justice. Uh, but uh, at the same time, absolutely appreciating that these are all fascinating developments in life that require us to look at the law from all possible perspectives and the new perspectives we don't know yet. Yeah. yet. That's the most important one. So um, with this, if I could have uh, your applause to First Advocate General.